Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the breakout session for the More Is Possible event titled Disrupt the Supply Chain with Additive Manufacturing. So if that's what you came for, you're in the right place. Um, if it's not, I encourage you to stick around because it's, it's, it's some exciting stuff. Uh, so let's dive in. Now, um, you know, kind of want to lead into this presentation talking about some of the supply chain challenges that we're seeing globally. And I think a great anecdote is what happened in the Suez Canal a few months ago, where there was a boat that got kind of trapped inside the canal and turned out to be a massive bottleneck because there was, um, I looked it up, $10 billion worth of trade flowing through that canal every single day. And just on this one boat, there was $9 billion worth of trade. So for the week that it took to get that boat out of the canal, there was... 336 ships that were trapped and not able to move through. And you can think of just about anyone had a part on those boats that they were waiting for. Uh, we need to start thinking about these challenges that occur because the world is unexpected outcomes. Um, and if we don't have solutions that we're ready to uh, react to these challenges, we get left with kind of, you know, scurrying around and trying to find some answers that, you know, aren't really working, fitting a square peg in a round hole. I just thought that this GIF was really funny um, analogy of what happened to Suez. And if you don't have tools to overcome these supply chain challenges, you, you're kind of left with some bad options like this. So here's our agenda for today, just to give you an idea of where we're going. Um, first, I'm going to give myself a brief introduction so you know who's talking to you. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Mark Forge and the industries that we cater towards. And then we're going to dive into the meat of it with uh, current state supply chains and really dig into some of the challenges and dilemmas that you experience in traditional manufacturing. Then we're going to start 3D printing into the equation. And with that, we can start talking about the future state and how supply chains can be much more efficient. Um, we'll wrap it up with the overview of like the benefits of additive and why you should be looking at it for your business. And then we'll save some time for questions and answers. So if you have questions that pop up, um, just type them into the chat and we'll address them at the end. So if that sounds good with everyone, uh, let's dive in. So like Andrew mentioned, I am a field application engineer and I support the East Coast of the United States. And what my job to, is to do is to apply our technology to customer specific challenges. I really dig into what the requirements are and what type of capabilities you're searching for, and then make sure that's aligned with our platform. So this is a really cool job because I get to see a mix of everything. Like anyone who's making anything is looking at 3D printing to make those things more efficiently. So some days it's automotive, aerospace, medical, system integrators, machine shops, and education. Some days it's all those things in one, in one day. Um, it's like a real life how it's made episode. I've just, you know, really learned a ton about just the humble products in the world and what, uh, you know, challenges they experience with manufacturing. And it's my job to basically find the right solution. So you can see a very wide array of our printers and for each customer, they have different challenges that they're trying to solve. And we vet it out and figure out what the right solution is. I want to dial back the clock a little bit before I stepped in this field role when I was an associate application engineer at Mark Forge. And this uh, role was really revolving around global benchmark demand when we print parts for customers to help them validate the technology. And during that time, I was running eight metal printers, three of our industrial and like six of our composite printers. So I got a ton of hands-on experience with the printers, seeing a very wide range of parts. Um, and kind of this cool stat within our software, we track some of the uh, telemetry on like print hours and print jobs and stuff like that. And I've been here for two and a half years. And as you can see this number right here, I've had 2,200 days of printing. If you round that out in two years, that's like two and a half days of printing for every one calendar day. I just want to show this to everyone because it really reflects just the efficiency of 3D printing and how much you can use this technology without it being a blocker in your in your day-to-day -day job. So if I can do like dozens of printers all on my own, I think one printer is something that is uh, up for the challenge. And then just down back clock a little bit further, my background's in aerospace tooling. I used to work at Sikorsky, which is a Lockheed Martin company, you know, famous for like the Black Hawk helicopter, but also presidential CH-53K and this cool new one called the Raider. Um, and, you know, the common thread in 3D printing, which we'll talk about today, is that tooling is the common thread. So I got a ton of uh, eye-opening experience to these industrial applications and really realized the benefits that we could have with 3D printing. But it was initially I wanted to scratch of doing this for the entire manufacturing industry, not just for a single company. So for that reason, I came to Mark Forge where I saw the best opportunity for growth in this market. So who is Mark Forge? Uh, we are a 3D printing company. We design and manufacture them in-house just outside of Boston. And our mission statement is to reinvent manufacturing today so our customers can build anything they imagine tomorrow. And we were founded in 2014 by two MIT graduates 
And at that time, when the patents expired, there were kind of this uh, gap in the industry. So if we kind of look at this chart right here, on one end of the spectrum, we have these hobbyist printers. And the great thing about these is they were uh, economical and very easy to use, very user-friendly. But they were very limited in scope of the materials that you could print, the quality of the prints, and the accuracy. So it really limited the amount of addressable applications that you could use these printers for. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we had these industrial printers. And these had a lot of barriers to entry because they were very expensive and there was a lot of facility requirements with like hazmat suits and respirators, all sorts of PPE that made it very inaccessible to the wide majority of companies. However, they could print industrial materials with pretty good quality. So there was a wide scope of addressable applications. But there was like this big gap in between those two, right? What if we could have a printer that has the user friendliness of the hobbyist printers while loading up with the materials that make it suitable for industrial applications. And that's the sweet spot that we fit into. That's why our mission statement is to reinvent manufacturing so our customers can build anything. And we want anyone who makes anything, any type of company able to leverage this technology and not have these barriers to entry and be very user-friendly. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we fit in back in 2014 and the mission that we continue to drive today. So Mark Forge, we are the inventors of the Digital Forge. This is the platform that we call our added manufacturing platform. What the Digital Forge consists of is hardware, software, and materials. We make all three of those things in-house so that we know exactly what's going into the printer. If we know those material properties, we know exactly how to control it. And with that, we can ensure reliability and high quality every time you hit print. And it's really powered by this cloud-first software architecture where the printer is in its simplest state the day you buy it. And at the time you buy it, it doesn't have these features, which will be later released, that helps it become more valuable over time. So we have a very well-proven track record of pushing these over-the-air updates for things like increasing print speed, adding new infill patterns, adjusting new layer heights, all sorts of different parameters that make it more valuable to you. So the piece of hardware actually appreciates over time rather than depreciates. And we are gonna to continue to innovate based on customer demand and telling us what features you want and you see that stuff come into your printer just when you hit update. Okay, so, you know, Mark Forge, we make 3D printers, um, and it's really reflected in the industrial manufacturing industry. And a big topic that we've been focusing on lately is supply chains and the ways that 3D printers can help augment it and make it more resilient to challenges that occur. So before we jump into that, I have this uh, quick like three minute video called Life of a Bolt. And I think it does a good job of kind of setting the stage on the amount of handoffs and just the, uh, all the little touch points that go on when we traditionally manufacture. So I'm gonna hit play and I'm gonna kind of talk over the video. So this is a video made by Red Bull. It's about a bolt. Um, this is your part number right here. And you can imagine that's just one part number that's probably a hundred different variations of it, but we're just gonna dig into this one and talk about you know what goes into it. So like there's an engineering change order, ECO, we need to design a new bolt and it starts with sketching. That's the way I work is I like to sketch on paper first, you know, have unlimited imagination. Then we jump into the computer, do our CAD design, put it in the assembly, uh, create our draw sheet, bill of materials, all that. Next step is to document that in our PLM system, print out the draw sheet and send it out to a machine shop. They procure their raw material, cut it to the stock size, and then sign off. Then it goes to your machine shop, throw it in the lathe, turn it down to its uh, features, do your CAM programming. And now we're going to do some milling to the, uh, to the bolt head, and we sign off. Now it switches hands again. Now we go to the quality department and we're gonna do some inspection. We're gonna measure critical features with calipers. We're gonna use some gauges and some fixtures to ensure it's in line, maybe some visual inspection on the thread pitches and ensure that this component meets our specs. Do a little bit of material testing, hardness testing, and we sign off again. Now we go to post-processing, um, probably like some corrosion resistant element and sign off again. Now heat treatment, we put it into an oven, you know, you hit go, let it heat up, just like making a pizza, um, and get to the new mechanical properties and sign off again. Now we're doing laser etching, post-processing, serializing the part number, and now we're shipping it. So now it's moving from manufacturing to a warehouse, gets brought into the warehouse, and it gets checked into inventory. So now we know how many of these parts and we know where it is, and it goes into a box. And the box sits, and it sits, and it sits, and it sits. 
until one day someone needs the bolt and they go in and check it out. Simple enough, they write it at the location, bring it down to the car. We install the bolt. And what's cool about that is once we install the bolt, we can do these other operations. But until we install it, we can't get this wheel on the, the car itself. So this one little bolt could have been holding up the final assembly and could hold up the car going into the race and hopefully winning. So I don't know. As an engineer, I just find it super uh, satisfying watching these manufacturing operations. But when you kind of zoom out and think about everything that went into this part number right here, there's obviously a lot of steps that um, each one of them you can think is a vulnerability. So kind of like zooming out and reviewing everything that went in there, you know, we had the design, we had the man manufacturing, post-processing, shipping, logistics, and everything to go from your engineering change order to installing the bolt. And again, the reason why I want to show this is just to give us like a set the stage that there's a lot of handoffs. There's a lot of different steps, a lot of different tools that get used just to make a humble part like a bolt. So the way Mark Forge kind of thinks about supply chains is we fit into like these five stages where we go from manufacturing to distribution. And this is where all the logistics happen, right? We need to distribute the part to get to the right places when they might need it. Then it goes into a warehouse. And then when it gets called upon, we ship it from that warehouse to the point of need. You know, pretty streamlined, right? Like you don't manufacture where you always use it. And there's a supply chain that revolves around that type of stuff. So with that in mind, let's talk about some dilemmas that might occur with the process of going from manufacturing to installation. The first challenge that you might have with inventory is finding the right part right? Like that bolt had a part number and there's probably 50 variations and we need to know which one might fail the first, which one is most susceptible to failure. And we need to ensure that we have that part in inventory so that we can quickly replace it. The next challenge that you might experience is the right quantity of parts. So you kind of left with two options here. Uh, you try to order as few as possible so that you don't over forecast the amount of parts and carry them all in inventory. But then you risk the situation where you need one more and you didn't quite manufacture enough or the other end of the spectrum where we order 10,000 parts, but in the next five years, only 3,000 get used. And now we have 7,000 parts that we're keeping in inventory that never really get checked out. Um, so you don't want to over forecast, you don't want under forecast, you want just the right amount of parts. And then the time of need, right? Like ideally we can predict these things using statistics and analytics and some past data to know when these parts fail. Um, but it's not always the most scientific method. And we know that things happen and we need to be able to respond to it quickly to keep the lights on at the company. And then finally, the point of need, right? We need to know where the part is gonna fail and have something as close to it as possible so that we can shorten the feedback loop of getting it from manufacturing to the point of need. And the important element of these four stages is that we need to be four for four, right? If any one of these four doesn't meet our needs, we're gonna be delayed, we're gonna be waiting, and we're not gonna be able to resume operations until all four of these align into getting the part to the location at the time it's needed. So that's current state supply chains when we're using traditional manufacturing. Um, 3D printing is kind of like a digital manufacturing. And when we kind of think of industry 4.0, we see a lot of buzzwords here, automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, data, um, I'm here to talk about 3D printing, and this is where I think the biggest impact can be had on adding resilience to your, su your supply chain. So let me show you how. Now, when we looked at these stages before, there was these five steps, and it all goes from the place that it's manufactured to the place that it's needed. And the reason why it can be so efficient is because there's all this distribution and warehousing and shipping. But let's imagine that we could just put the manufacturing at the point of need. If that occurs, then we can get rid of these three stages where most of the bottlenecks occur. If we do that, then we can go directly from manufacturing at the point of need and be able to respond at the time of need. So with 3D printing, it's a much more flexible manufacturing process that doesn't have all the skilled labor, doesn't have all the tooling. It's a lot easier to just hit print and get your part. And then you can cut out all this middle area um, that usually slows things down. And if we kind of revisit the process of the bolt and just kind of zoom out and pretend that we 3D printed it, we can get rid of like 80% of these steps. Not everything's going to go away. We still need to do the CAD design. You still need to do your heat treatment. Um, but a lot of the areas that there's friction, we can eliminate to go more directly from an engineering design to installation. So the big theme of this presentation is kind of this, this statement that I thought up of. Uh, it's not just the part, it's the circumstance. 
And this can be a little counterintuitive because in traditional manufacturing, it's both. It is the part too. And that's because in traditional manufacturing, the more complex the part, the longer it takes to make and the more expensive it becomes. We can kind of eliminate that constraint with 3D printing where we have nearly unlimited design freedom. So it doesn't matter the geometry. And we can just focus on the circumstance that occurs to reply, respond to that challenge as immediately as possible. I'm gonna be providing three examples today on this mission. First one has to do with some parts breaking down in remote locations. The next one has to do with responding to very fast deadlines and having uh, a solution on site. And the third has to do with a post-process and equipment that is carrying inventory in ways that they've rethought their supply chain. So like zoomed out, like these have seemingly nothing to do with each other, but the common thread is they all have supply chains and have spare parts that need to get two places at the right time. And it's not just the part, it's a circumstance. It's not the part. With 3D printing, it doesn't matter if it's a simple part or a complex part. It doesn't matter if it's a big part or a small part. It doesn't matter if it's one part or a hundred parts. 3D printing gives you this flexibility to not be constrained by the geometry and instead be hyper-focused on the circumstance. And we're gonna be covering three different circumstances today. I've kind of bucked them into these three R's. The first is resilience. So we wanna have a process that is flexible enough that when unexpected challenges occur, we can kind of rebound off of them and have a solution immediately, immediately in place to overcome the challenge. Next up is responsive. So we want to have a process in place that is able to respond to unexpected challenges as quickly as possible. And then reactive, having a better, more streamlined line towards um, being able to re react to these unexpected challenges instead of relying on statistics and analytics to predict them. If we can just react when these situations occur, we can respond quicker and add more resilience. So first one being resilience. And the use case I'm focusing on here is with the Marines, but it's alike with the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. Uh, they definitely have one of the most impressive supply chains when you think about the troops being forward deployed to very remote locations with a ton of equipment that's all vulnerable to failure. And ideally you bring one of everything, a backup of everything. Of course, you can't actually do that. And you need to rely on your data to identify the parts that are most vulnerable and have enough in inventory that they can be self-sufficient in replacing those parts. So the situation here, the circumstance is kind of like a Humvee going out looking like this and coming back like that. And how do we repair that Humvee so it can go back out into combat? So the, the way the Marines are tackling and approaching this issue is instead of trying to carry all these parts in inventory, uh, bring in a hub of manufacturing equipment equipped inside a shipping container that is like a digital factory. Um, it's 3D printers, it's CNC machines, it's laser cutters, but 3D printers are really the most exciting part because it doesn't require the skilled labor to be able to make complex parts. You know, the, the Army, they've always been early adopters of new technology. Think of like GPS that they've had access to decades before it made it to mainstream public. And 3D prints fall on a very similar trajectory. Um, they like our technology so much that they actually had some more specific requirements that we retuned and developed a brand new product for called the X7 Field Edition. So this is our industrial series printer, but equipped inside a ruggedized Pelican case, such that they could basically take a helicopter, fly it in, parachute it down at the location, and be printing within 10 minutes of the printer arriving. So when we think about the resilience, right, let, let, let's stick to this Humvee example. You know, it goes into combat, it comes back and the door is damaged and specifically the door handle is broken. Now they're kind of left with three options here. Option one is leave the door off if they need to go back into combat. But now the person sitting in there is exposed to the environment. Option two is to put the door on, but without a handle. So if something happens, they need to get out. That person is stuck in that seat and needs to hop to the other seat. And that's a delay in time. That's a risk. Or option three is they go into combat with instead of five Humvees, they only have four. Now they're not putting their best foot forward. These types of circumstances are pretty common with manufacturing where you need the part fast and you're willing to pay a premium for it. So the solution, none of those three were adequate, so they had to find a new door handle. And this is where you get left with the situation of a helicopter taking a $10 door handle on a $20,000 ride to get it there as quickly as possible so that they can go back out into combat. Or option B. Option B is let's put a printer at that exact location and grow that part with additive manufacturing at that exact site. And how much fit faster and cheaper could we have done it if that was the situation? This is the approach that they're taking. So here's like that door handle right there. You know, this, this is going to go onto the Humvee and allow that operator to keep the door on, but also get out if he needs it. 
And these type of spare parts, we can think about the impacts that it has. So even with being compared to a helicopter ride coming from a nearby location that has the door handle being taken off of their car, we're still 200% faster. You know, from all the logistics of scheduling the helicopter, of uninstalling the door, of getting it to that location, it's a lot quicker to just hit print where you need it. And then like this is, you know, one of the most compelling use cases, but, uh, you know, in lieu of instead of taking the helicopter ride, we are like 50 orders of magnitude less expensive um, than taking that approach where they need the part and they're willing to pay more for it. Whereas if you can just print it, you can save a lot of money. Then the third element isn't so much to do with uh, supply chains necessarily, but I think we all have a duty to the planet to leave it in a better state than we came into. So we need to start thinking about like, you know, some green aspects to it. And with the helicopter taking that ride, it would have emitted over 14 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We need to start thinking in a more sustainable way. If we can start manufacturing at the point of need, we can eliminate all this greenhouse emission and serve our planet the credit it deserves. So not every example is gonna be, you know, comparing a helicopter ride, but I think we all can relate to situations where we need an answer and we have to pay a premium to get that part at the location. And if it's a very remote one, it's gonna be a premium. All right, the next example is about responsiveness. And this comes from a company called Wartzilla. And what they do is maintenance and repair operations to cruise ships. So essentially these cruise ships come in with thousands of vacationers and the steps go as far as they need to break down the ship, do their maintenance and repair operations, and then ship it back out. Now, if you're the people who took time off from work and you're waiting to go on vacation, all you care about is going down the ship. But if you're the engineer, you're the technician, you're the manager that's relying on these MRO operations going as smoothly as possible to meet that deadline, this has to be a crazy stressful time to be inside that, uh, that group. And you know, a lot can go wrong, especially with a product that has so many parts and a lot of things that are exposed to the environment and vulnerable to failure. So when it comes in, you know, uh, it's a big boat and big boats mean big parts and big parts mean heavy parts. Uh, specifically, you know, they, they need to, you know, replace some rusty bolts, they need to lube up the gears, um, and they need to uninstall some end of life components. Now, Wardzilla experienced this issue where the cruise ship came in and they had to take a piston out and install a new one. And the piston that was installed in this bolt turned out to be a legacy design. And all the other cruise ships in their fleet actually have a newer piston. So the tool that was used for the newer design actually doesn't fit on this piston. And that means that they can't take the old one out. Until they can't take that old one out, they can't put the new one in. Until they put the new one in, there's about 50 subsequent operations that are relying on that piston being installed. So they're just sitting and waiting. So, you know, there's a group of manufacturing engineers sitting around a table trying to figure out, what do we do? How are we going to get this piston out? We don't have a tool in our toolbox to, to have a solution. They started looking around and found some inventory at a location across the world that they could borrow the tool, take it out of their warehouse, and ship it over to this location so they can get the piston out. Of course, you know, it, it's in a computer. Um, hopefully it's on the shelf in the warehouse where it says it is, and it's still gonna take us a few weeks to get that here, to get that piston out. This is one of my favorite use cases because this piston is 2000 pounds. And there was an engineer sitting around that table who was bold enough to make the pitch that we should 3D print this piston because we are just sitting around and waiting and the alternative is better than just trying it out and seeing if it works. With Mark Forge, we have this continuous fiber reinforcement process. So like what we can do is embed continuous fibers into our parts, being Kevlar, fiberglass, or carbon fiber. When you do that, you don't talk about plastic parts. We're talking true composites. And when you talk about true composites, we can do applications that are lifting heavy parts like this piston. When I was an engineer at Sikorsky, I don't know if I would have ever been crazy enough to say we should use a plastic tool to pick up a 2,000 pound piston and stake my reputation on that. However, this engineer had the confidence in our technology and knew that the problem was so big that they would be willing to try anything. And this was a home run application. So one of the takeaways here is that maintenance and repair operations, they rely on custom tools. And you know, not just tools that you can get at Home Depot, no Phillips heads, no hammers, you know, true engineered custom tools that need to be kept in inventory and you cannot do the operation unless you have the right tool for the job. So this use case really spread the awareness around 3D printing and a way to respond to these unexpected challenges when the boat comes in. And, you know, Wardzilla, they have over 12 docks across the world that these boats come into and they do their MRO. 
And they're taking this new approach where they're deploying a printer at each one of those locations. And now with 3D printing, they can have their centralized hub where there's an engineer working on a computer and making digital files that can then be sent out to each printer. So anyone who needs a tool can be, uh, they, they can send out the tool from the centralized command center and just start hitting print so that the next day when they come in, the tool is sitting on their print bed and they can go do their operation rather than taking the lifting tool from this location and shipping it all the way to there to continue and keep the lights on. And what's the impact here? Well, the impact besides, you know, reducing cost and lead time, like it was a lot cheaper to print it than to ship it around the world. Um, but it's the secondary benefits and the high level benefits. So by deploying all these printers to all these locations, Wartzilla has actually realized a 4% decrease in missed deadlines. And when you try to calculate that number of the thousands of people that paid for a ticket to go on that ship on time because they already took off work, 4% is a massive number. I'm not saying it's all because of 3D printing, but 3D printing is what has given them the resilience and the responsiveness when these challenges occur to have the right tool in the toolbox to respond to these uh, unexpected challenges. Now the last step is uh, reactive. And this comes from a company called BMF that makes post-processing equipment. So essentially a part comes in with like its machine and lines and it goes through this media blaster and comes out looking to the customer spec. Uh, this product is called Twister. So essentially a component loads into these gears and it spins it so the media attacks all areas of the part. And there's a lot of consumables on this because these are mechanical components. Now from the ground up, when they were designing this, they decided to 3D print the gears themselves and realized that the mechanical properties are sufficient enough to make these an end use application. The initial value drivers were lightweighted. They wanted to make it out of plastic instead of aluminum because the lighter it is, the less power input and the more seamless of an operation it can do. But then the second thing is no tooling. So if you're a manager, you wanna be encouraging your engineers to always be innovating, always trying new things, always trying to improve the product. But when you have a plastic injection mold, your geometry is locked in. And instead with a 3D printer, you don't have tools. It's just a digital file that can be continuously updated. So engineers can try things out like new pitch designs, new number of teeth, or just a more cohesive compact design. That's why they printed these initially, but the greater benefit came as an unexpected consequence of inventory control. So when we talk about like the carrying cost of keeping inventory, there's a lot that goes into it. And I actually learned a lot researching for this presentation, but when you have parts sitting on shelves, there's all these different parameters of like, where is it located? Um, how many parts, how much weight, uh, how, how often are you check them out? There's a lot that goes into keeping inventory and the cost becomes very high. So you wanna try to minimize this as much as possible. When I looked at Twister's consumables, I was able to find it online and it's all in German, but I was able to kind of navigate and zoom in on some of the pictures. This was what was exciting. Is I identified over nine parts that they're 3D printing in end use applications that are used in our technology such that they don't have to keep thousands of parts in inventory. They don't have minimum order quantities of 10,000 to keep in all 10,000. Whenever a part goes out, they just simply reprint it, always have one in stock and just keep that continuously updated. And then the other end, there's like these door handles, right? Like you would design it with a safety factor such that it will never break, um, but the customers rely on the door handle to open it up and take go. So you need to keep the spare parts in inventory to keep the lights on. But how often is this gonna happen? It's a difficult thing to forecast. Instead of keeping 5,000 on the shelf and in the next five years, only a hundred get used, they can just keep one in inventory and not have all these carrying costs. So the takeaway there is that they have over nine consumables with virtually zero inventory carrying cost because they were compelled enough to use 3D printing for the inherent benefits of additive. And then the secondary benefits of keeping uh, very lightweight inventory is where it really transformed their business. So when we talk about the benefits of 3D printing, uh, it's specific, specifically relevant to supply chains, it fits into these three buckets. The first reason is ease of use. It's a printer, so it should be as easy to operate and as reliable as a printer is. You don't need skilled machinists. It's a very easy uh, technology to adopt, and it's a printer. You hit go and you get your parts back, and for that reason, it's very compelling to put it at locations that people might need parts. The second aspect is digital inventory. So now instead of carrying all these parts and putting them in boxes and putting them on shelves, we can just have a digital file. And we can send that digital file from anywhere in the world to the printers where they're located. And now we're not talking weight and box size, we're just talking megabytes of storage. And that's something that Mark Forge uh, carries within our software. 
And then the third element is distributed manufacturing. So instead of the stages where you have manufacturing and they get shipped around to the point of need, we can just distribute the manufacturer and have a centralized area that we can kick out the parts. And then you have the part right where you need it. So these three elements make 3D printing very compelling as a reason to add them to your supply chain. So the next question that you might be having logically is then why is Mark Forge the best 3D printing solution to add this resilience? I encourage you to think of these three things. These are what I think are most important. The first is part strength. This is where Mark Forge really differentiates ourselves with that continuous fiber capability. No one can come even within order of magnitude of the part strength that we can. And we're hyper-focused on replacing machined aluminum parts. Only with our technology do we have that strength. If you can replace machined aluminum, or in like the case of a lifting tool that's even steel, we can replace everything beneath there. Next up is quality. It's something that we care about a ton. Like the parts need to look good because I know that when you're a champion for this technology, you're trying to convince others, you need the parts to look good. Otherwise people are gonna poke holes and say, it doesn't look good enough. Like the world's not ready for layer lines yet and things like that. And I think our quality really speaks for itself, but like, you know, just seeing the surface finish of our parts, it's impeccable. And you wouldn't even know that's 3D printed unless you have a very keen eye for it. And then the third thing is reliability. And I really do hold this as like the top candidate for the importance of a 3D printer because it's a printer. And when you hit go, all you care about is getting that part. And if the print failed and you need to reprint it and tune it, then you probably should just traditionally manufacture it because it could have been quicker. The reliability is backed up by Mark Forge with our digital Forge platform that I talked about earlier. The fact that we make the hardware, the software, and the materials all in-house so that we know the exact inputs are able to control it. This is why we have such high reliability on our machines. So if you want to have the widest array of applications that you can print to tackle these spare parts, you really want the inside the sweet spot. And this is the exact sweet spot that Mark Forge fits into. There's this quote from a, a magazine that was reviewing 3D printers. I just want to state it that the Mark II, which is our desktop printer, remains top of many engineers' wish list thanks to its bulletproof build, workhorse output, and ability to, to produce parts capable of replacing metal materials. So what I would say is go inside your PLM and search for these three criteria. Material is equivalent up to aluminum, tolerance plus or minus five thou, and then these two bounding boxes depend on which printer series you're looking at. And I feel very confident that will return thousands of parts and you can make the assumption that all those are suitable to be 3D printed and add robustness and resilience to your supply chain. So this is kind of the way I think about it. Um, I really hope that that gives you some reasons to think about supply chain resilience and the way that this world is very unexpected. You know, the, the mission statement is that some ship their manufacturing parts around the world, but others are simply hidden print. I really hope that this enlightens you today on some of the opportunities for 3D printing within your company. And I hope it encourages you to look at Mark Forge as a solution that can help you add more resilience to your supply chain and help your business be more prepared for the unexpected challenges that might occur. So it looks like I left enough time, good. Um, that's my presentation on uh, supply chain resilience and I've left some, left some time for Q&A. So Andrew, do we have some questions that I can answer? Yeah, we've got a couple. Ross, thank you so much. That was that was great. You crushed it. I love the military example and uh, the Wartzilla. I mean, we know these parts are strong, these composites, but 2,000 pounds is pretty neat. So yeah. uh, great presentation, crushed it. So a couple questions here at the end in the chat here. Um, so Nick asks, just a fun question. Do any of your printers actually use 3D printed parts in them? And I think I might know the answer to that, but... Yeah, um, kind of two ways you can think about that. So in the prototyping stage when we're making new printers, like we're constantly printing parts as prototypes that go on the machine that are being made to print parts. We're printing parts as the product develops, which is you know a very unique circumstance. Um, but we do have a couple of parts on our printers that kind of fall into that sweet spot of like hundreds of parts per year, such as like just little handles that go on it that we'd rather not you know invest in the injection mold and then we're locked to one geometry. Um, so we have three unique parts on our printers that are 3D printed. We don't advertise it, but if you take a close enough look, you'll, you'll realize, hey, that's that's that Onyx material that Mark Forge makes. Awesome. Really cool. I, I remember um, the spindle in the middle of the spool. Yeah. You, you guys used to 3D print that, but, but I, don't, I don't think it is anymore, but that, that was pretty neat. Um, let's see, another question. So I know that Mark Forge makes strong composites and metals, but is there any any stronger materials coming out? Anything uh, 
anything behind the scenes you could talk about? Yeah. Anything neat so coming like, up? You know, with, with our technology, like this padded continuous fiber, like it makes parts exceptionally strong. So we're not talking plastics, we're talking composites. And that gives you a very wide array of applications. Um, but some people say, hey, we need heat resistance. Hey, we need wear resistance. So we naturally went to, to metal as the next step to meet some of those criteria. And, you know, in some parts you can combine the two. So you get stiffness here that gives you lightweight and benefits and then just localize your wear resistance such that if there's a design change, you just replace that one component. We've got something right on the horizon too. And I cannot uh, be the whistleblower for it. But uh, you should check back in in a week and see some of the new materials that are coming out in a Mark Forge announcement. Ross, it's just you and I here, man. Just, just you just and I. Me, just, just two guys talking. Just, just two guys talking. Tell me what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got no, you can't. So another, another quick, I think we have time for one more. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, when, when is uh, Blacksmith coming out for metal? Uh, blacksmith for metal. So I didn't really touch on Blacksmith, but Blacksmith is this capability on our industrial series printers where I talk about reliability being important. And one of the hardwares that we put into the printer is a laser micrometer that actually measures the print bed before you hit go. And it ensures that's in with, do, within a certain degree of levelness. If anything is to go wrong with the print, it's usually from those first layers not printing correctly. So the laser micrometer ensures that it will. Um, and then with our over the year updates that I talked about continuously improving, we revisited that laser and actually equipped it to be a in-process inspection tool. So as we're printing, we're actually scanning it overlaying that with the model and identifying tolerance ranges, you know, falling within a certain um, degree of spec. Now, what's cool about that too, is we're collecting all this data and realizing, you know, quarter inch holes always print at 0.252. So what we can do is actually use artificial intelligence to identify those and apply this compensation beforehand where we undersize your hole slightly to accommodate for the oversized um, end result. Now where that's headed next, this is on our composites, is metal, where we can start seeing the center shrinkage and deformation. And again, apply the same AI logic with machine learning and apply these compensations beforehand. As far as the date goes, I'm not sure. Um, if you're printed in metal though, and you find value in this, then please reach out to me because we are a customer driven company and the way that we prioritize our product uh, feedback is based on feedback from our customers. So I would love to learn more about the use cases and how you would use blacksmith for metal. Ross, real quick, you got one minute left. A couple questions came in. One, speaking of supply chains, how easily can you resupply the raw material stock to print in your printers? And do they print molds? If so, can they make solid parts? Got it. Let me answer that one quickly. Um, the raw material, it's not a stock size. It's not a block. It's not a rod. It's just a spool of material. We make these materials, so we are always in stock and always shipping them out as design point is as well to their customers. Uh, the... Answer as far as like ability to switch out materials, it's the three minute operation. I don't know, Andrew, how long? I, I'm pretty quick with material changeover. You just got to wait for it to heat up. So it takes yeah. like two minutes. So that's it. Yeah. yeah. And same thing with metal. Um, so, you know, as long as you have material, you don't need to have the right stock size. It can print any shape you imagine. And this is really a good reason why 3D printing is so impactful with supply chains is because we don't have these constraints anymore. And real quick, molds for us. Uh, molds. I see right our yes, you stop, can. But 30 that, that seconds is a on molds. Great question. <laughs> um, you can definitely print molds. Absolutely. And we can do conformal cooling and unique features and near net shaped parts. A lot of benefits to be discovered there. And I would definitely encourage whoever asked that question to reach out to Design Point and we can start evaluating your molds and see how they fit for our system. Ross, thank you so much for answering those questions. The presentation, it was really great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so absolutely. much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. Yeah, thanks for your thank time you, everyone. Today. Thanks, Andrew. Have a good one, I'm everyone. end it now. Have a great day, guys.